that we can ever fully need to understand the West Philippine Sea situation. So, um, and then comes little old me to just tell you just how it feels to be out there at sea with these fishermen. And I, I still believe that it counts for something. I still believe that those voices out there who don't have the degrees that we have, who don't have the access to information that we have, they still have stories to tell that we need to learn from and we need to listen to them starting now. Um, well, my job as a journalist is threefold. First is one of the, my jobs is to engage with the, these people and try to pick their brains and understand further just the dynamics of this whole situation. It is as complicated as we all think it is. The second part of my job is to go out there and be there out at sea with, with the fishermen, with the people, and see what they see, feel what they feel, and bring them back to you. After that, the third part of my job is to bring these all together and find something simple and digestible to present to the other people who have no knowledge of the sea, who have no knowledge of the laws, who have no knowledge of all this data. And it is a very difficult task, as I'm sure all of my colleagues at the back of the room um, will agree with. Um, but, you know, it's, it's also difficult at the moment, emotionally, as a Filipino, to be seeing all this and recognize all of the efforts that everyone's been doing all the stories and the facts that everyone has been dishing out, and to somehow still not see it being reflected in reality, it it gets to you as a person. But it's wow, it's a fight worth fighting. Um, so I guess that's the reason why we're all still here. I'm supposed to just talk about Scarborough Shoal, but I have been making rounds of the West Philippine Sea for the past several years, and I believe that those past experiences still do provide some kind of better and deeper context to the Scarborough Shoal situation. And this is the reason why I can confidently call the situation in the West Philippines here a swarm, because I was just there. Uh, my last um, field trip to the West Philippines here was in Scarborough Shoal, where I spent 10 nights in one of those wooden boats. and. There is no better way to call it than just a swarm. And these are some of the neighbors that we've had to say hi to each and every day. Um, so indulge me for a while. Let's take a look back at some of the things that have happened. Um, I noticed for the past few months and years, the things that we used to hold true, or uh, we, hold to, we used to hold as fact, have somehow, whether deliberately or not, been twisted or forgotten. So let's. Let's go back, let's rewind. Um, our cameras are magically useful in this aspect. So let's go back to March 29, 2014, the date which I can't forget because it's my birthday. Um, this was the first time that the Philippine government um, opened the doors to the Philippine media to see what really was happening in the West Philippine Sea. And as a consequence, this was the first time that the Filipino people really got a visual grasp of what the heck was going on. This was aboard the AM700, which took, which was on a resupply, and um, it was on a mission going to a union show. And that was where the journalists managed to get access to the site. <laughs>
China. Kanina hinarangan ng barko ito ang daanan ng ating barko at ngayon ay sinasabay niya ang pangkarta natin magpunta sa ayong misyon. To be there and to have to do that spiel was very difficult. Uh, my cameraman, Angel, he, he's actually one of the guys at the back. Uh, he thought that I was nervous because my jaw was shaking, but really, I think it was anger. Like, I could not understand. I knew where we were. We were in the exclusive economic zone. And then there's this voice on the radio telling me that I'm doing something wrong and that we should head back because we are in the wrong place and doing the wrong thing. Um, it's, yes, I am Filipino, but I am a journalist, and you don't need to know about my feelings. So each and every time this happens, we always have to suck it up and just tell you what it, what's going on. That ship was so close that I could actually see the dry fish, like the dying sila dun sa malaking boat. Uh, and I could see that that man, na pinubuga kami, na parang, Parang bangaw, parang langaw. Go away, go away, he was saying. I could see the beads of sweat in the personnel of the Navy who were trying to figure out, do we go, do we turn back, do we maneuver, what do we do? Uh, who is out there with us? Um, so these are the experiences that the journalists have the privilege to bring back to you. It gives life and a different perspective to all of these um, serious things that we discuss here on dry land. Now let's go to April 2014. This was actually just by coincidence. I was filming my documentary on the Spratlys and I was in Pagas Island on the day that President, former President Obama arrived. So we were um, watching bits and pieces of his speech in Pagas Island as long as there was signal, but it, we didn't get the whole of it. But at the, at the end of that day, we, we took a tour of the island and this is what we saw. Uh, Dr. J. Batumbahal, I saw you uh, speak about um, poaching of giant clams as early as 2016. I will outdo you on this because this is 2014 and this is what we saw about two kilometers from the shoreline of Pagasai.
That was 2014, two kilometers from Pagasa Island. I remember Dr. Or, Dr. Onda saying that when they went on that expedition to Pagasa, they were excited and they because they wanted to see the best coral reefs and potential diving spots, but they saw nothing. I think these guys are partly responsible for your disappointment, Doc. Um, okay, next next chapter. Fast forward to July 14, 2016. Two days after we won the arbitral ruling, we wanted to find out what it looked like, what that victory looked like out at sea. And it did not look like much of a win. Even before they left, they knew they were bound to meet the China Coast Guard at sea. But they also knew that the ruling of the arbitral tribunal had come out, declaring it illegal for China to prevent Filipino fishermen from entering Scarborough Shoal. Inside them was hope that maybe things would be different this time around. Fifteen miles before reaching Scarborough Shoal, the first of the Chinese guards made its move. Ship number 3306 sailed toward the Filipino fishing boat and went around it. By the time the boat reached the vicinity of Scarborough Shoal, four Chinese Coast Guard ships were there. And just by their positions, Glenn could tell that they were blocking entry into the shoal. The Filipinos decided not to attempt and just to anchor half a mile away from the shoal just so they could rest and catch some fish. But just as the passengers had started fishing, the Coast Guard ships released two rubber boats which headed toward the Filipino boat and fast. The Filipino fishermen have already anchored just outside Scarborough Shoal after being prevented from going inside. But now the Chinese Coast Guard ships have released two speed boats and these two boats are fast approaching this ship right now. This is the China Coast Guard. They did not smile, and while running circles around the Filipino boat, crewmen of the Chinese Coast Guard took videos and pictures of the passengers' faces. The Filipino crew eventually gave in to the pressure. They raised the anchor and inched their way home. The speedboats escorted the Filipino boat away from the shoal for several minutes, perhaps making sure that the Filipinos would not come back. Out of fear for their own lives, the Filipino fishermen have decided to leave this sea area even though they're already outside Scarborough Shoal itself. The date now is July 14. It's been two days since the ruling of the arbitral tribunal came out. But it looks like the Filipino victory there is a paper victory for now. They hung around so long that I was able to do a stand up with them as background. That is, I couldn't believe it while it was happening. Um, one last flashback. So after this came out, um, government said that they've talked to the Chinese government and that they have allowed Filipino fishermen to once again fish in Scarborough Shoal. So November 2016, that same year, we came back just to see how this permission to fish actually looked like. Um, the, I went with the captain of the mother boat, which we now understand better because of the Jemfer incident the big boat, um, he, he showed me what it was inside the, scarp, the, the shoal itself and what was supposed to be just a casual trip of sorts to show me around uh, turned into a sad tale of something that he noticed or they noticed had changed inside the Scarborough Shoal. Pasok sa loob mismo ng Scarborough Shoal, sandaling iniwan ng Kapitang Sibudog ang tinitimon niyang bangka at sumakay sa service boat na maliit. Sa likod siya pumuslit kung saan walang pantay ng China Coast Guard. 
Pagpasok sa loob, naunawaan na namin kung bakit dito nila gustong umangkla at bakit dito sila nagtatago tuwing bumabagyo. Kalmado ang tubig dito. Parang wala ka sa gitna ng dagat. Pero habang nagmamasid, may napansin si Budog na pagbabago sa tubig. Lagi kasi ito ang mga bakura nito ang papabaw. Ngayon, nung pumasok yung malalaking barko na kumukuha ng takrobo, kung malukay nila yung sila, kaya malalim na siya. Kuha niya ito noong unang bahagi ng taon. Habang silang mga Pilipino, panakaw na naghuhuli sa labas, nakita niya ang loob ng Scarborough na puno ng mga bangka at barko ng China na nagkahapot ng maraming taklobo o giant clam na endangered species. Puno yung kanila, mga lagrana ng taklobo. Marami mo. Hindi lang kuhan. Mga 200 piraso yata yung maliliit. Ganito rin ang aktibidad ng China sa maraming bahagi ng Spratly Island sa Palawan. So when, when you've had personal experience and visual confirmation and a record of all the hostilities that have been happening, it is very difficult for us to suddenly change the story as they see fit and say, actually we're friends now, all of that is in the past. Because have any apologies been made for these past atrocities? There have been none. Has there been a change of heart, a change of mind? There have been none. Um, and so, you know, um, apart from that, there has been this sort of forgetting of what actually has taken place. And as a journalist, as journalists, I feel this is the part that we can play. We're not the experts, but we were the ones who were there. We have the ones who, we are the ones who have a chronicle of what took place, and it's our job to keep bringing it back and showing the people if the people have been starting to forget. Um, on a positive note, people are more concerned now because the 2014 uh, giant clam story made virtually no impact. They couldn't understand what the big fuss was about some dead clams being dug out of the ocean. But now with better understanding and just a constant conversation about it, people have been um, more um, receptive. They understand this more, that this isn't just about clams. This is about the environment and its impact on the Filipino people. So on the topic of clams, <laughs> let's go now to sort of present day, 2019, when um, I went on another trip to Scarborough Shoal, this was mid-April, and this was when we saw for ourselves uh, the stories that the first boat captain had been saying. Um, it was very surprising and a little unsettling to suddenly be holding this footage while still being out there in the West Philippine Sea, surrounded by the swarm. Uh, we had to secure the footage for the meantime and just air it when we were on our way back home, both to secure our safety and also to make sure that the fishermen we were with would still be able to catch their fish without us impeding on their livelihood. Uh, so the, a lot of you have seen this footage before. It is the now infamous giant clams of Scarborough. <laughs> that we saw earlier in the Pagasa Island footage. They also sort them out, I suppose, between good quality clams and average clams. Okay. 
a lot about the damage to this, just how bad it is and how bad it looks. Um, but as a journalist, I always prefer to listen to the people whose very lives depend on these waters. Um, so I asked the fishermen we were with what this means to them and how this whole operation has affected their livelihood. This is Muling and his best friend, Art. They're the ones who fish together, eat together, exchange jokes together, and they share the, ex the same experience out of Scarborough Shore. Mm -hmm. So before this, uh, so he was saying, in the future, there's n there's going to be nothing left but sand in Scarborough Shoal, and that people their age are already seeing the destruction of what more their children. They won't even get to see what they see. Um, so it's a matter of even them passing down their lives and their stories. They are starting to believe that this is no longer going to happen just on the grounds of what they see. Um, so what the, what, what the role of the journalist is in this case is bearing witness just to go out there and do the inconvenient, sleep on top of an, you know, a styrofoam box full of fish, um, you know, stay for 10 nights in a wooden boat. If that's what it takes to, to get the real story and to bring those stories home, then that's our job and that's what we do. And hopefully that's what we will keep doing. Um, this, that, that's what we contribute to this whole discussion on the West Philippine Sea. So, you know, when they now come to an air-conditioned room and tell us we are now friends, all we have to do is look back on these moments and say, have they made amends? Have they discussed this? Have they addressed this? Has anything changed? And if the answer is no, then it would be hard to tell the people that, you know what, those villains that we told you about just a year ago, they're not villains anymore. Um, 
Sudah. Because we have this. It, it is on video, it is on paper, it's, it's on YouTube. 2014 to 2016, there was this much hostility. In 2019, there have been no amends to it. So when they tell you now that look, you're, they're free to fish, the problem is over in the South China Sea or in Scarborough Shoal. We still have these guys patrolling Scarborough Shoal like roving cops. I, when I went home, my friends were saying, you don't have much of a tan after attending Sojourn Out at Sea. That's because I was hiding, because they were everywhere. And I didn't want to compromise the fishing operations of the men who were kind enough to let me ride their boat. Um, I was in a malong most of the time trying to shoot from under a pillow, inside the engine room, just, just to secure these images for you guys to see. So if they say, no, there's less Chinese presence, let's count the blue boats. They call the, the fishermen call them the asul, yung mga asul, because they don't know anything about it. All they know is these guys never leave. These guys rove, or are roving just like the Chinese Coast Guard. And whatever else they're doing out there, they have no idea. All they know is they are always there. And this is just one of the two asuls that we spent time with out at Scarborough Shore. Um, we, when we were there, there were eight of these. And each of these, there are at least four of the smaller boats doing the uh, um, the harvesting of the giant clams. At one point, we had to move our boat because this was getting too close and we would get rammed by accident. So we had to do the adjusting and change our locations. More blue boats, blue ships. And the neighbors. Uh, the fishermen have started to make a game of saying hi to them and good morning just to see if they do. They wave back and then they have a good laugh at it if, uh, when they do. It's like they're keeping a point system as to how many Chinese fishermen get, have said hi to them. It's, it's, that's just the way it is. I've tried and they've said hi, they've said hi to them at some point. There are smoke belching boats. And those big boots that are everywhere. So again, let's remember this, 2014. If they say, oh, we're studying this because we just found, a, found out about it now. 2014, I knew about it and I was just rather randomly there and I respect the armed forces and the authorities enough to know that they know this. 2016, there was a story about it already. 2019, another story. There's just more footage this time. They, they cannot say that they just found, about, found out about it and they're just reviewing their options and studying the situation. It, it is just not true. So there has to be another reason. Um, fishermen are coming home with less catch, they say. Apart from the issue of them having less access into Scarborough Shoal, there's just less fish. And I think we, it's understandable why, because of the operations that we've seen. Another story that uh, I did manage to show, they were emerging from the water with boils and itches whenever they got too close to an operation of um, clam poaching because for some reason when I think Doc you would know more about this when uh, it, it, it gets dug up something reacts underwater and they get they have to either stop or move to another place there was one morning when all, all, came, all of them came home and they were just scratching their legs and their arms just complaining and they were talking about, they were murmuring about Taklobos again. 
Um, so th th this is a direct impact on Filipinos. Documented reality on the ground or at sea is difficult to dispute, so we have to keep asking why they are disputing it. This is what we have to understand at our level on dry land. Contrary to what others are saying, these are never just about clams or corals or Nemo's and Dories and other sea creatures that are out there. Yes, they're important, but it matters to us because it spells a difference in the lives of Filipinos. Um, before I try to discuss the impact of this on the future of the Filipinos, but it was too abstract for the audiences to understand. Um, I was speaking with one ally of the West Philippine Sea that I trust with my life, and he presented the problem it's much, in a much clearer way than I myself understood it in a whole new light. Um, he said, we are talking about securing future Filipinos not the future of Filipinos in some abstract way. We are talking about making sure that future Filipinos have enough food on their plate, future Filipino parents have enough to feed their families. That is what we're fighting for, not whether we like the taste of clams or whether uh, this, the, it's not a good diving site anymore. This is food, this is security, this is life. As we debate the West Philippine Sea, the West Philippine Sea, as they know it, is gradually being destroyed. And even the fishermen in San Jose, Mindoro, um, who I've spoken to after the Jember incident, have said as much of the reed bank. They, they've also noticed the decline in fishing. So as we wait for our country to assert our right, we are slowly and maybe irreversibly losing the resources that we have the right to feed our families with. Say this because there have been so many voices out there, including my own, including reporters and all of the experts and scientists and, and legal geniuses. I think it's time that we give the power back to the ordinary Filipino, the fisher folk. They're the ones who know the ocean best. They're the ones who notice every single change that goes on there and what it means to them and to the ocean. Um, we have to listen to them and try not to change their opinion on things that they already know. Um, I, this, is, this has become my personal goal as well, to give them more space in the discourse less of my interpretation of reality and just let them speak. They know the sea better than us. And whatever damage we do together as a nation, they're the ones who are going to feel it. So, um, just this ends my presentation, but I hope that all of us uh, take this as a challenge to respect the voice the knowledge and the opinion of the Filipino 